morning, church, and welcome. We're so happy you're here to worship with us today. Let's put our hands together, lift our voices, and let's praise our God. Come on.
The same God that never fails when I fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your name. that that's the cry of your heart today, that whatever God's calling you to in whatever situation or circumstance, that your answer is, yes, I will, because we know that he is our strength, he is our hope, he is our refuge, that he goes before us and fights our battles, that he is with us in whatever situation we're in. So whatever he's calling you to today, may your cry be, yes, I will, and may he receive praise in the midst of it. Today is an exciting day for us as a church, and this weekend has been an exciting weekend because we get to do some celebrating with some men and women and young men and women who have made this declaration that they've said yes to Jesus, that he is their hope, their strength, he is the one who has given them life, that they put their trust in him and they're declaring it to the world through the act of baptism, and we get to celebrate that today. Isn't that awesome, church? And if you don't know what baptism is, it's simply a public declaration of a life surrender to Jesus, that they have put their trust in his work, in his life, in his death on the cross, his burial and resurrection for the salvation of their souls. And the Bible says when we put our trust in Jesus, that we become united to him, that our sin and shame and the debt that we owe is nailed to the cross 
It's paid for. And that our old life is buried in the grave. And as he rose to new life, he raises us to new life. And that is our hope, that is our faith, that is our foundation. And that's what this act of baptism symbolizes. It is not an act, it isn't an act of salvation. It is the first step of obedience from salvation to declare to the world that we belong to Jesus and that we're gonna follow him. So the way we do it here is we've got some baptismals set up out in the courtyard and uh, they have a camera out there and it's gonna be on the screen behind, behind me, in front of you. And uh, we're gonna be celebrating and praising God and worshiping along with them. And what's cool about this is we have a speaker set up so that they can hear us praising God and rejoicing alongside of them. The word of God says that all of heaven rejoices for one that's come home. And so as a church, we wanna join in that celebration. When they come up out of that water, we wanna make a joyful noise to the Lord, amen. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do a practice shout of praise on three, and then we'll jump in. Here we go, one, two, three. testimony. We want to lift our voices along with it. So let's lift this up. I needed rescue. I needed rescue. My sin was heavy. The chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter. I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healer. My eyes are open, cause when 
We rejoice in you for every life that has been changed, rescued, redeemed, and restored. We give you all the glory, all the praise. We love you, Lord, and it's in Jesus' name we pray all these things. And all God's people said, amen. Come on, church. Amen. You can have a seat. Hey everyone, my name is Peter and welcome to Rock Point. If this is your first time here with us, we'd love to know. Stop by the New Here Start Here table in the courtyard to say hi and learn more about how you can get connected. While you're here with us today, we encourage you to take out your smartphone and type in rockpoint.io. Here you can follow along with the sermon, take notes, keep track of upcoming events, join a group or serving team. Being able to come together and worship our God is one of our favorite things to do here at Rock Point. We'd love for you to join us at our night of worship this Wednesday at 7 p.m. right here on campus. Bring the family and invite your friends to be a part of an incredible night of worshiping our Savior. Free child care is available, but space is limited. Visit rockpoint.io and tap on the What's Happening tab to learn more and to register your children. There are over 20,000 children in the foster care system in Arizona alone, and Rock Point is committed to making a difference in this crisis. One awesome way you can step up to help is to become a foster mentor. As a mentor, you get to be a friend, an encourager, and someone to help give stability in an otherwise unstable situation. Even if you're just considering what this might look like, we'd love for you to come to our foster mentor orientation meeting on Saturday, October 6th at 9 a.m. right here on campus. Head over to rockpoint.io and click on the What's Happening tab to register and learn more about this life-changing opportunity. Rockpoint Worship is looking for skilled musicians and dedicated worshipers to join our team. We are currently seeking electric guitar, bass, drums, and keys players, as well as vocalists. Our worship team serves many ministries across campus and is a great opportunity for gifted musicians to serve who have a genuine heart for worship. Online auditions are always open, so head over to rockpoint.io and click on the Happenings tab for more information and to submit your audition. If you have any questions, feel free to find one of our band members after service. We'd love to talk to you. Our mission here at Rock Point is to point people to Jesus by loving them like Jesus. Thank you for being a part of this by living intentionally and through the faithful giving of your tithes and offerings. While we don't collect the offering in service, we do have boxes near all the exits, both in the worship center and the lobby. You can also give online at rockpoint.io. Let us know if we can help you in any way while you're here with us today, and be sure to connect with us on rockpoint.io and on social media. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from master storyteller Jonah Werner. Jonah is an internationally touring speaker and singer-songwriter who's visiting us from Boulder, Colorado. Please give a warm welcome to Jonah Werner. Finally stood up and said, I'm sick of feeling small. It's a revolution, so come and see. You're the one, you're the one, you're the one for me. This is my confession, I'm a broken man. No, I've been locked up in the suffering, sickness, and pain. I'm on the borderline, on the witness stand. So I'll admit it, admit it, I did it again. Take me down to the place where I can see him. I need him, the freedom, seek to my river. Shame and the shiver, they disappear with the fear. Oh, love, draw me near. I'm not the man I once was. No, no, no. Cause all my life I waited for the one to rip me out of the cage and set me free. It's time to say it, you're the one. You're the one, you're the one, you're the one for me. Empires and kings. 
kingdoms and places and people are stuck inside themselves like a record player skipping on repeat but repeat after me i won't be with the majority you're the one you're the one you're the one for me out of the cage and to set me free it's time to say and you're the one you're the one you're the one you're the one for me because all my life I waited for the one to rip me out of the cage and to set me free it's time to say and you're the one you're the one you're the one you're the one for me you're the one you're The one for me Hey, good morning, everybody. I am so honored to get to be here with you all. I'm, I'm so excited. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I'm excited to share my story with you, a uh, little bit of it, and then uh, and share kind of what, what Jesus put on my heart for you all today. Uh, if I had sort of a soundtrack to my life or, or a theme song to my days, it, it would be the song I just played. It. All my life I waited for the one to rip me out of the cage and set me free. It's time to say it, Jesus, you're the one. You're the one for me. And I think that all of us sort of metaphorically have sort of a soundtrack to our lives. We have a song in our heart. And that song can change. Maybe it was different when you were younger. For some people, the song is maybe your song is a song of peace or a song of joy or contentment. And for some people, uh, it's more of a, a song of, of sorrow or mourning or despair or anxiety or fear or depression or addiction. But regardless sort of what the song of your heart is, God says, I want to give you a new song. I will put a new song in your mouth, a hymn of praise to God. And regardless of where you're at, Jesus wants to meet you in that place. Now, when I say the name of Jesus, what do you think? What comes to mind? You know, my picture of Jesus when I was a little kid was totally skewed. My mom would take me and my brothers to Sunday school, and we would drive home from church, and she would say to us, boys, what did you learn at church today about Jesus? And we would pop our heads up from the back seat in a panic. We hadn't listened to a single word they said. The only reason we liked going to church was because they served Tang, the beverage you can drink hot or cold, your choice. And little frosted animal cookies with sprinkles on top. They were so good. And we're sitting there panicked, and all of a sudden, my three-year-old little brother bails us out, and he says, hey, Ma, who's Jeebus? And she says, you know who Jesus is. And he said, is Jeebus that guy in the picture on the wall when you walk into the church, the one with the long, flowy, flow, Pantene Pro-V hairdo with the blue color contacts and the white robe with the purple sash and the little lamb on his shoulder? And my mom says, yes, that is Jesus. And he says, that guy who's supposed to be Jewish but looks like he's from Norway. <laughs> my mom said, yes, that is Jesus. And he said, oh, Mom, Jeebus freaks me out big time. <laughs> and he did me, too, because I couldn't really relate to the, you know, the human rendering of who Jesus was supposed to be. I, I was a little boy. I wanted to have fun and adventure in life, and that character didn't look fun to me. But as the years went by, I learned and heard about the real Jesus, the Jesus who's the most interesting, amazing person to ever walk the face of the earth. I heard of the Jesus of John 10, 10, the one who said that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. He says, I've come so that you can have life abundant. We were created for life to the full. You see, the reason Jesus, Jesus didn't come to earth just to write some tale of a baby born in less than royal fare, and the reason that he came wasn't just to live and die, but it was to live and die and rise again to change a fate that on our own we can't bear. 
And so think about the ones who sit beside you and think about how far you've come and then think about the ones in your life who are gone or passed away and then think about the holy one. I'm talking about a man who's bigger than our hopes. He's bigger than our dreams. He's greater than our fears. He's greater than our pain. He is justice for the ones who've been hurt and live in shame. He's the reason that we live and you're the reason that he came. The reason that Jesus came to earth wasn't politics or law. He turned the tables on the leaders of his day. And the reason that he came wasn't scientific sense. Inexplicably, he made a fool out of the grave. And so think about the ones who sit beside you and think about how far you've come and think about the ones who are gone, passed away and think about the Holy One. I'm talking about a man who's bigger than our hopes. He's bigger than our dreams. He's greater than our fears. He's greater than our shame. He is justice for the ones who've been hurt and live in pain. He's the reason that we live and you are the reason that he came. He came for the sick and for the poor, for the lost and counted out, for the kids who light our Christmases with joy, for the broken, for the confused, for the dad who just left and ran away, for the lonely and the orphan little boy, for justice, for reprieve, for a hope to set us free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You're the reason that he came. You're the reason that he came. He came to make a way. He came to save the day. He came to set free broken you and broken me.
I got a broken life, broken sea, I got a broken heart, broken me, I got a broken heart, broken soul, I got broken Thank you. That really is the truth of my life. When I was a little boy, I, I felt empty and broken and confused. And my home probably looked like a lot of other folks' home. We looked fine on the outside, but on the inside, uh, we were falling apart. My dad was a high school dropout. He, he was a hardworking man. He was a blue collar miner up in the mountains of Colorado. And he was injured when I was a little boy and, and he became addicted to, to prescription narcotics and he was a drug addict for the rest of my growing up and then my my uh, my mom worked minimum wage jobs to get us through and we were a broken family we were in need of rescue and in need of help grew up um, just outside of Buena Vista Colorado Buena Vista is a town of about 2,000 people I grew up in in a suburb of Buena Vista in a town called Nathrop where I made up 2% of the total population and every weekend, I would go into the big town of Buena Vista. I, I wanted to escape home in whatever way that I could. And in high school, I thought that I was a relatively hip fella. I had short hair on top, long hair in the back. I was business by day and party by night. I had a Def Leppard tank top that I wore every day with Jordache jeans. I had an Ogilvy home perm in the back of my hair that my big brother gave me. And I was a fast driver. I drove a 1969 jet black Chevrolet Camaro with glass packs on the bottom and nitrous in the trunk. In my dreams. I actually drove a, a peach-colored 1985 Ford Fiesta. It was four cylinders of pure power. And every weekend, I would drive into the town of Buena Vista to get my best friend, and we would drive down the main drag. We would take a right at the town's only stoplight, go down to the softball field, do a few donuts in the dirt, turn back around, go left at the light, right over the loafing jug, drive over to the 7-Eleven, and drive over to the drugstore and park my car next to cars full of girls. It was a thing we called cruising. And we would, we would park next to the girls, and they would always drive away. <laughs> I said, what's wrong with us? I mean, we're all right, right? Like, we're, we're pretty good looking and, and, and we're pretty hip. And, and he said, I, I know, jo Jonah, they're just intimidated by us. This guy is so true. I mean, we're just, we're more uptown, you know? Like, we're more cosmopolitan. Like, we went to Denver once. I said, we need to go somewhere where the girls are a little bit more sophisticated, like where they know the city, where they, they also like the outdoors, but they appreciate the city life. We need to take a road trip, and so we did, to Phoenix, Arizona. And there we are, we're driving through Scottsdale, we're seeing things we had never seen before. And all of a sudden we see this girl and she walks into a Starbucks coffee shop and I say, stop the car, that's her. And he says, that's who? And I say, that's the woman of my dreams. He says, that's the first woman we have seen. I said, that's the first real woman I've ever seen in my whole life. And he said, no, Jonah, look at her and then look at you. She's like six foot five, and you're like five foot six. There ain't no way a girl like that is going to go for a guy like you. And I said, this looks like a job for me, so everybody just follow me because you need a little controversy, and it'll be so empty without me. And I got out of the car, and I walked inside of the Starbucks there, and I stood behind her in line, and she walked up so confidently to the front, and she said, yes, um, I would like a venti mocha macchiato, soy latte, upside down with whip, a grip, and a kung fu twist, please, extra hot, and a quadruple shot. I had not yet learned to speak this language that she was speaking, so I was very intimidated, and I said, can I just have, like, a cup of coffee or something? And she said, you're not from around here, are you? And I said, no. No. But how you doing? She walked away. She just walked away. They always seemed to just walk away. I didn't know why. See, I wanted to find love. I wanted to find somebody to come and rescue me from my, my life, from my problems. I didn't know back then that people can't rescue people. 
We can only lead each other to the feet of the great rescuer, right? But back then, I, I wanted rescue. I wanted something to fill the hole in my heart. And so, I, you know, I, like a lot of us, I had these several, you know, dating relationships. But all of the relationships seemed like one-sided, you know? Like, I don't know if you can relate to me in this, but they, it, you know, they always, they all seem like, you know, she and I were both really in love with her, but neither of us cared for me all that much. So I went off to college, to the University of Colorado, and and, uh, and I did what a lot of us do. I just started dating this girl, and, and she was so wrong for me, and I was so wrong for her, but we, we just dated out of kind of convenience, and we dated all the way until the summer after junior year. We were together, and she said, you know what, Jonah, it is time you come home and meet my parents. And I said, what, why? And she said, because it, it's time we either get married or we break up. And I said, those are my only two choices. <laughs> oh, man, okay, I guess I'll meet your parents. And the thing was, she was, you know, I was this sort of redneck kid from the middle of the mountains of Colorado. She was a debutante from the southeast. Her dad was a restaurateur who owned a chain of biscuit restaurants across the southeast where you'd go and get your biscuits and gravy. And so we called her the Biscuit Princess, heir to the Biscuit Throne. And I went with the Biscuit Princess out to North Carolina. Her parents lived just on Wrightsville Beach outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. And I went and met, met her folks. And, and they, were, they were nice enough people for sure. They just wanted to change everything about me. They wanted me to cut off my amazing long hair. They wanted me. To, they wanted to see if I could actually become part of company material. So they had me try on their company polo shirt with the biscuit logo over here. It was July 3rd. I was at their house and I'm wearing the pol biscuit polo and I'm thinking I've got to get out of here right now. I've got to leave. And so I, I excused myself from the dinner table at about 7:30 and said, ah, I'm feeling pretty tired. And they said, What is 7:30? And I said, like, I don't know. I went up to my room and then I, I looked out and peeked out the door and I waited until they weren't looking and then I left. I went downstairs and I went into the garage and I didn't know what I was gonna do. I didn't have a cell phone back then. I didn't really have any money or anything. I just knew I needed to leave. And first thing I did was I took that polo shirt off and I threw it on the ground. And then I thought, what am I gonna do? And I looked over and I saw a fishing pole and I said, oh yeah, I'm going fishing. And so I went and I grabbed this fishing pole and I walked down the beach to Johnny Mercer's pier. I walked to the very end of the pier and it was bustling. I mean, it was the day before the 4th of July, so there were 100, 150 people out there. And I cast my line out into the deep, dark Atlantic Ocean and I prayed to God, dear God, please help me to not catch a fish because I'm from Colorado and I would not know what to do. And I certainly didn't want to cause a scene. You know, I was very shy. I didn't like people looking at me. I, I, I kind of wanted to be remain in my own little world. And I'm, I just sat there for a minute. And I need this. This is my. This is a, This is what my braces looked like in middle school. minding my own business when all of the sudden oh no I got a bite and it felt like a big bite it felt like a big fish and 
oh no, and it started pulling on my line, and then it started making that noise that it makes when your line is being pulled on your reel and pulling on the drag, and all of a sudden people started sort of looking over at me and, ah, nothing to see here. I did not want them to look at me, and I, and I was trying to hide the fact that I had this big fish in my fishing pole, and all of a sudden this little boy came up to me, and he said, mister, I think you got a fish on your fishing pole. Yeah, I know I do, don't tell anybody. And he stuck his hand up on my leg and he said, don't worry, mister, we'll get him in together. Get off me, no. So the little kid went running away, he went to the pier master, this is the guy in charge of the pier, and he told him that I had a big fish. And so the pier master came out with a big bullhorn and he said, lines up. And everyone started reeling in their line. I guess this is so that their line doesn't get tangled up with my line. And then he says, gather round. And they all gathered around me. And all I could think was, oh, why? Why did I take off my shirt? <laughs> hey, man, uh, I'm from Colorado. I've caught like trout before, but I've never caught a fish in the ocean. I really don't know what I'm doing. Should I just reel him up the pier? And he said, no, son, that, no, that's a big fish. I'm going to break your line. And I said, well, do you have a net I can net him with? And he said, you mean like a 30-foot long one that would reach from here to the water? And I said, yes. And he said, no. And I said, well, what do I do? And he said, well, normally I would have you walk down to the beach and, and get him in that way. But honestly, I think your tackle's too light. I think the weight of the fish and the breaking waves, I think it would break your line. We got to get that fish out beyond the breakers. And I said, what, what, how do we do that? And he said, it's, n it's not that big of a deal. I'll hold your fishing pole. And then you just listen to my voice and you follow my spotlight and I'll lead you to your prize. What do you mean my prize? What do you mean you lead me to my prize? He said, you just, you, you just listen to my voice, follow my light, and then swim out to the fish. What? No way, man. Like not in shark infested waters. It's dark out at this point. No way am I gonna do that. You don't even, I mean, you don't know it, but, but my, my name is Jonah. me and what if I call will you hear me and what if I trust oh will you help me and if I'm drowning will you save me and someone in the crowd says oh yeah we want to see that and I said yeah I know you want to see me die whatever and I don't know what to do and then to complicate matters I look down to the other end of the pier and I see a shadowy figure coming toward me hips shaking back and forth and oh no biscuit princess oh what am I gonna do and she walks up and she says oh my what is wrong with you what are you doing out here like why did you leave the house my parents are freaking out and like how come you're not wearing a shirt and why are all these people gathered around you and I said you know what it's time I tell you the truth the truth is truth is that I'm a fisherman, babe. Yeah, the water was calling and I had to go. Got a pretty big one on there right now, to be honest with you. And she says, oh, I don't care. Just get home right now or else. And she walks away and everybody's looking at her and then they're looking at me and, and then she gets far away and then the woman next to me, a woman puts her hand on my shoulder and she says, oh son, you gotta go. You gotta go get that fish. She ain't worth it. And I don't know what it was y'all, but I do know that I was created for life to the full. And when you listen to your heart and you realize that sometimes you do crazy things, you, sometimes you trust in something bigger than yourself. And at that moment I knew I had to. And so I handed the guy the fishing pole 
And then I, I took off running. And this is not an allegory. This is not a metaphor. This is a true story from my life. I ran down to the beach and I kicked off my shoes. And then I ran toward the surf in David Hasselhoff Baywatch sort of fashion. I ran in slow motion and I got to the edge of the water and then I dove in. And I landed on my chest in the sand because I didn't go quite far enough out. But I got back up and I started swimming. And I was so scared, but he said, you're just, you're doing great. Just listen to my voice and follow my light and I'll lead you to the prize. And pretty soon I was there. I was face to face with this black and white zebra striped fish with big human like teeth. And ah, what do I do now? He said, just grab them by the gills and bring them on home. That's disgusting. Okay, and so I grabbed the fish, sorry, and then I started swimming, and I was so scared. I had adrenaline and fear, and it was the whole combination of things, but it was life. And I got to the shore, and I stood, and I, I held up my prize, and everybody cheered. And I went up to the little pier house, and pier master says, oh, son, that thing's huge. That, that, that might be the biggest one I've ever seen. And I said, I don't know. And he said, I need to take down your information. And, and so he took down my information, and then he took a Polaroid picture of me and hung it on the walls of Johnny Mercer's pier. And I went back. The girl and I, we ended the relationship shortly afterwards. And I went back home, and I was at my folks' house in Colorado a, a, couple, of, a couple of months later, and I got something in the mail. I opened it up, and it was a certificate, and it said, this hereby certifies that Jonah Warner has caught a record size sheep's head fish off the coast of North Carolina. And I said, hey, mom, you got to get in here. And she came in and she said, what is it, honey? And I said, you're never going to believe it. I've only caught one fish in the ocean in my whole life, and it was the biggest one they had. Does that make me some sort of fishing hero? And she said, oh, I don't know, honey, but going to make for a good story someday. And it is a true story. And even my closest friends still don't believe that it's a true story. But I've brought a little picture evidence. This was the day after. Yep. And it is a true story, but of course there's a metaphor in there, right? Of course there is, because the reality is, is that most of us, we just... We just want to hang out on the pier up there. We don't, we don't want to cause a scene. We don't want to shake things up in life. We don't want to, we want to be comfortable, right? And we certainly don't want to jump in the cold water. But, but the reality is, is that we were created to dive in. We were created to trust in something bigger than ourselves. We were created for rescue and help from the one great rescuer. The reality is, is that if you dive in in your life, you experience life to the full. If you dive in in your marriage, it becomes stronger. If you dive in in your friendships, they become richer. Dive into your work, it becomes more satisfying. If you dive in and face that hard conversation, you become free. If you dive in and you challenge addiction or share that secret you've been share keeping to yourself, if you dive in, then you find hope freedom and life to the full and it's okay if you ask the questions it's okay if along the way you say but but what if I fall will you, will you catch me and if I call will you hear me if I trust will you help me and if I'm drowning will you save me and what if I fall will you catch me and what if I call Will you hear me? And what if I trust? Oh, will you help me? And if I'm drowning, will you save me?
Thank you. You know, that that is true, you know, I, that God, Jesus, God wants us to ask the hard questions. He wants us to say, what if, what if I fall, will you catch me? He wants us to ask him to save us from drowning. He wants to meet us in that place. He wants to meet us in the hard place. If you ask him those questions in your life, he answers back to you with a resounding yes. Yes, I will help you. Yes, I will walk with you. Of course I will. You're my son. Of course I will. You're my beloved. You're my daughter. Of course I will. In Proverbs 2, 1 through 5, he says, My son, if you receive my words, my daughter, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments within you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you shout out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it as silver and search for it as hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of God. And you will find knowledge of God. So he says, if you receive my word, and then if you not only obey my commandments, but if you treasure them, treasure them. I put those commandments there because I love you. Treasure my commandments and then listen and then incline your, your heart toward me and then call out. Shout out, maybe literally say, God, I need your help. I need you. I need you in this place. I need a new song in my heart. And search for it. Search for him like treasure, like silver. And you will find, you will find the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of God. And we certainly live in a world where we need it. We need it. We need the fear of the Lord. We need the knowledge of God. We're gonna raise up our children, we need it. We need it in our own hearts and our own lives and we need it in this world, in a, in a tense political climate, in a, uh, you know, a, a culture of bigotry and hate and racism and violence and fear. We need Jesus. I, uh, I ended up eventually getting married and, and I have um, two kiddos and uh, here's a picture of my family. Uh, that's my wife, Ruthie, and, and my daughter, Piper, and my son, Hawk. Very musician-y names, I know. Um, and Piper's just like this little spitfire. She's, uh, she, she loves everybody. She's friends with everybody. She's super social. And then Hawk is, uh, he doesn't really like people. Uh, he's really introverted. He, 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 the teacher last year said she never heard him talk. Uh, he just doesn't talk much. He, he has a hard time making eye contact. But at, at nighttime, when we go to bed, when it's dark, he'll talk to me. And he'll tell me the secrets of his heart. It's my favorite time. And then he'll say, Dad, would you tell me a story? It has to be true, and it has to have you in it. And so I'll tell him stories. And I was telling him a story recently uh, about when I was a little boy, all I wanted was to grow up, become a man, and drive a truck. And... Uh, he said to me, Dad, what does it mean to become a man? And I thought, well, there, there's a lot that can be said there. But I said, let me think about it, son, and I'll get back to you. And so I went and I just sort of thought and I wrote down these words for my son that he, he doesn't understand now, but I hope he will someday. That what makes a man, he says, I got to know the plan, he says. I got to be the best of the best that I can. He said, what if I could change the world with just the beat of my heart? If just the pulse of my blood was the beginning, the start of a revolution, evolution of mind to get up and stand up for the ones left behind. I'm talking loosen the chains. I'm talking breaking the curses. I'm talking hallelujah praise songs and biblical verses. Jailbirds flying away, being done with addiction. And now they're feeling and healing and getting hit with a vision that maybe just maybe we were made to see heaven on the other side of human condition. I say, oh, son, if you want to be John Wayne, you got to have true grit. You can't sit, you can't quit, you can't do any of it. You got to rise up, seek wisdom from only above, have peace, hope, and patience, but the greatest is love. And believe the God-man who came to set guilt on fire will be the revolution that you so deeply desire. Follow him, model him. 
He is tough to no end. He is rugged but loving and gentle but shoving the tables on lies, unmasking disguise. He's the prince of all peace, the creator of truth. He was and is and always will do what he says. The great teacher, more friend of sinners than preacher, the juxtaposed reacher of all mankind. And he has taught me this. He said, be humble. You'll stumble, but be true, take a stand. Love your neighbor, your sister, your brother, your landlord, coworkers, boss. And now I'm at a loss because he even taught me to love those who might not love me back. My enemies, naysayers, liars and haters, hypocrites, hustlers, fakers and takers, but love is so much bigger. It's the one great elixir. It's the indiscriminate mixture of heart and soul fixer. And when I was a little boy, my mom told me God is love. And if God is love, take love, take it in droves, put it on with your clothes and say it and sing it until everyone knows that love is our plan. It's the answer to stand on. Love is our plan and son, that's what makes a man. So what I hope you walk away with uh, to conclude is, you know, I really hope you take a look at your life and you say, what is sort of the soundtrack of my heart? What is the theme song of my life? And then this week, try to share it with somebody, share it with a friend or a spouse and, and start a conversation there and see where Jesus meets you in that. And then we've talked about the fact that we are broken, of course, and we are in need of a savior, that, that people can't rescue people People can only lead others to the feet of the great rescuer. And we talk about the fact that if you want life to the full, you have to dive in, to go for it, to face that issue, to have the conversation, to be honest, to ask for forgiveness, to dive in. And then we talk about the fact that, that, that Jesus says he's gonna put a new song in your heart. And my hope and prayer for you is that he does just that that he gives you a new song to sing. All right, we're gonna close with a, a song. This is a, a song by a little known Irish quartet uh, by the name of U2. And uh, they, they wrote this song straight out of the Bible. Straight, it's, it's the verse that, that I just shared with you, Psalm 40. Um, and so we're gonna sing that. I'm, I'm gonna loop it and then I'm gonna get you to sing with me and I'm gonna get you in my loop. So uh, just a sec. So, well, yeah, okay. So, the way that a lot of you have probably seen live looping before, um, I've been doing it for most of my career, and there have been some younger people who've started doing it recently. There's a guy named Ed Sheeran who does it, stole it from me, okay? <laughs> Um, but basically what it is, is you start recording at the beginning of a measure of music, and then you stop recording at the beginning of another measure of music, and then it plays that back in a loop like this. Now you have to do it kind of perfectly in rhythm or it's a train wreck, but this is pretty good. And so then you can do what's called overdubbing, and that is uh, to record tracks over the tracks. You could do, I could do 100 overdubs if I wanted to, so I could do whatever I want. Per I could do percussion. Or if I wanted to be hip with the young people, I could Or if I wanted to be more like my generation, I could. And then if I want, I can talk into this mic and then it'll take what I say and Also take things out of the loop, things that maybe aren't helping me get my message across to my audience.
Rock point, baby. Uh, so th this last song is 40. I'm going to, uh, so here. Okay, so I'm going to build the, the loop with the, uh, my delay pedal. So this is the foundation of it. Um, the delay, it's basically just an echo. And so it sounds like this. And so I'm gonna, uh, if, if I do the echo on beat, sounds like this. If I hit it right on the echo, then it, it just does that. It doesn't sound like anything. But if I hit it on the off beat, then it sounds like. pray for you all. Jesus, I pray that everyone in here, you know all their hearts, you know all their names, you know the hairs on their head. Jesus, I pray you would meet them where they need to be met, that they would dive in, that you would sing a new song into their hearts, into their lives, in the name of Jesus, just like you said you would. God, bless this community. Bless everyone in here. Bless their families. Bless this church in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.